Welcome back to the Adventures of Dr. Sane Anatomy Hour 10-1 Visceral Abdomen. So now we're going to talk about what's actually inside the abdomen. We covered the uh, musculature of the abdominal wall. Now we're going to get into what actually happens inside of there. So here you see these nice plush little visceral organ dolls. Uh, you can purchase those somewhere if you want. I don't care. Whatever. They're there. They're cute. So moving on. This is uh, what the, ab the first view you'll have of the internal abdomen. Uh, the abdomen is covered by this great sheath of uh, connective tissue and lipid uh, tissue uh, called the greater omentum, which is hanging off like the apron, like an apron, off of the uh, transverse colon and the stomach. When we flap that up, that's when we can see the small intestines, the uh, jejunum and the ileum. Uh, so that's what we'll first see. But uh, before we dig into that, there's some interesting structures on the internal surface of the abdominal wall that we should talk about. Uh, these are uh, some folds that occur mainly as a uh, part of the developmental process in utero when we're still receiving blood supply from our mothers through the, um, the placenta. We are also uh, releasing urine into our mother's bloodstream through the placenta uh, so that the mother can filter that uh, urine out and uh, send it to her own bladder. So what we see here are three folds, a median, a medial, and a lateral umbilical fold. The uh, median umbilical fold carries the urachus to the umbilicus, and uh, in utero that would travel to the placenta. Urachus carries urine from our developing bladder uh, through the placenta. Medial umbilical fold contains the umbilical artery. So the umbilical artery is sending spent blood or deoxygenated blood to the placenta, to the mother's bloodstream, blood circulation. Lateral umbilical fold uh, contains the inferior epigastric artery. Uh, so we'll learn more about these structures and their relation to each other uh, <clears throat> as we continue. Uh, but the uh, inferior epigastric artery is not traveling through the umbilicus. One thing uh, we notice coming superiorly out of the umbilicus is the, uh, in the adult, it's called the round ligament of the li liver or the ligamentum hepatis, uh, uh, um, with the, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, round ligament of the liver. I forgot the, uh, um, uh, I forgot the Latin uh, momentarily. I'll, I'll come up with it later. Uh, 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 so, but in the embryo, in uh, utero, that is called the umbilical vein, and that is carrying oxygenated blood from the uh, mother uh, to the uh, to the fetus. When that blood circulation changes, when the umbilicus is clamped off, that umbilical vein closes up uh, and becomes the round ligament of the liver. <clears throat> so now let's talk about some of these organs. So the round ligament of the liver is still in the adult traveling to uh, the liver. So we still see the pathway it would take, the ligamentum teres hepatis. Ligamentum teres hepatis is the round ligament of the liver. And so that travels into the liver, uh, into the inferior vena cava, joins up with the inferior vena cava in utero. But here it's closed off, so it's not doing much. You can see it here. It's embedded within the falsiform ligament, which divides the right and the left lobes of the liver. The falsiform ligament continues superiorly and divides off to form a kind of diamond shape on the top of the liver, and those are called coronary ligaments, left and right coronary ligaments. From the posterior view, we can see the more anterior quadrate lobe and the more posterior caudate lobe. Caudate is posterior because caudate means tail. So you know the caudate lobe is the tail. The quadrate lobe is more anterior. Uh, so there you see right and left liver uh, lobes. Uh, we have already talked about these ligaments, but something uh, we need to talk about is the porta hepatis, the door of the liver, the opening of the liver. And that porta hepatis uh, allows the passage of some of this vasculature, the uh, hepatic portal vein, the uh, proper hepatic artery, 
and the hepatic duct uh, coming down to the gallbladder. Uh, so here we can see uh, now that there are some areas we need to talk about in addition to the lobes, the bare area on top of the liver. So as that falciform ligament splits and forms the coronary ligament, that connective tissue layer is no longer on top of the superior portion of the liver, which is in contact with the diaphragm. So the superior portion of the liver and the diaphragm are in contact with each other. Uh, so there is nothing, no connective tissue encasing or covering or protecting this bare area on top of the liver. And if you'll recall, the, um, the danger space in the, um, the, the, between the ligaments in the neck travels down to the diaphragm and infections can travel down uh, into the thorax from there. But if an infection travels into that region and ends up passing through the diaphragm, it can infect the liver, which can cause very serious conditions very quickly. Um, what else do we have? So there is a, a small covering beneath this, uh, the ligament, that, the falciform ligament that covers the liver called Gleason's capsule. Uh, it's very thin. It's embedded in the surface and throughout the uh, liver. Um, but as the coronary ligaments join on either side over the right and left lobes, we call those uh, points of juncture the triangular ligaments, right and left. Uh, so here we can see a sagittal view, a mid-sagittal cross-section uh, drawing of the, uh, the contents of the peritoneum, the abdominal cavity, as it's called. Uh, so we can see the liver here, stomach, uh, the colon, the transverse portion of the colon, as well as uh, the jejunum and the ileum, uh, perhaps duodenum there, uh, and then the pelvic structure. But what we see here in blue and red, light blue and this kind of fuchsia red uh, color, are the different layers of the peritoneum. The peritoneum being the connective tissue that surrounds the uh, ab the internal abdominal wall and the uh, organs themselves. So this blue portion that's against the abdominal wall, that is called the parietal peritoneum. The red portion is where it reflects onto a visceral organ structure. And that red portion is called visceral peritoneum because it's against the viscera. You can see that the visceral peritoneum attaches uh, all of these uh, organs to the posterior abdominal wall. So they're not free floating or, or loose in the abdomen. They're very tightly controlled and contained. But you can see also that the uh, greater omentum and the lesser omentum above it uh, are actually uh, where the visceral peritoneum reflects on top of itself and folds on top of itself. So that's the greater omentum is visceral peritoneum. So because of the shape of the visceral uh, peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, we end up with little pockets throughout the abdomen. And these pockets are places uh, called recesses where fluids and infections can build up. So we have a pocket between much of the liver and the diaphragm called the subphrenic recess. That's the most superior portion uh, recess in the abdomen. We have the subhepatic recess below the liver. Hepat uh, hepatic means liver, so subhepatic recess. And we also have the hepatorenal recess between the liver and the kidneys, the renal gland of the kidney. And so if you'll notice about this is that this Morrison's pouch, the hepatorenal recess, in the uh, supine individual is the most inferior location in the abdomen. So fluid in a uh, immobile supine patient is going to build up here and cause distension and uh, infection can also build up there if there's a systemic uh, peritoneal infection. So uh, that's something to watch out for. This is why patients, even especially bedridden patients, should be moved uh, continually throughout the day, not just for the reasons of the um, um, the bed sores, uh, but also because of uh, fluid buildup, decubitus ulcers, bed sores. 
So here, of course, we have the digestive tract, uh, you know, you, various portions of it. You can see the colon is composed of this uh, kind of three-quarters window sh uh, frame shape, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon down to the rectum. Uh, the small intestine is composed of the jejunum proximally and the ileum distally. But pretty simple there. It is color-coded on your slide, and here it is animated, color-coded uh, here. So we'll go through those colors, and boom, done with that. Uh, so the esophagus passes through the diaphragm, uh, links up with the stomach, and the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve travels with the esophagus. Because of the development of the GI tract, uh, during development it's constantly turning and rotating, the left vagus uh, trunk or nerve rotates to the anterior side of the stomach and the GI tract and the right vagus nerve rotates posteriorly to the posterior side of the stomach. So left vagus nerve uh, is anterior in the abdomen. Uh, if the uh, portions of the stomach travel through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm, then that results in what's called a hiatal herniation. And that hiatal herniation can be a problem for many reasons. It can uh, uh, inhibit the functions of the stomach and, and uh, increase prevalence of gastric reflux, but it can also wear away at the vagus nerve that's on the surface of the stomach because you have a larger than normal structure inside this small hiatus. Uh, so that movement of the diaphragm is going to irritate the vagus nerve and cause a whole lot of um, autonomic problems. Uh, so moving on, we see here um, that the uh, stomach has two curvatures. It has a greater curvature, or a uh, uh, which which uh, is aligned with the greater omentum, and we have a lesser curvature, which is aligned with the lesser omentum above the stomach. So this uh, visceral peritoneum is covering the liver, covers down in this open space. That's the lesser. Uh, omentum then covers the surface of the stomach and transfers around down to the transverse colon. That's where the less, the greater omentum and the greater curvature forms. Then take a look at this and understand the uh, relationship of other organs with the stomach because these things are very closely packed. Uh, the pancreas, uh, the tail of the pancreas especially, is, is posterior to uh, the, the fundus of the stomach. Um, what else do we have? Uh, so, uh, anyway, you can look over this. Uh, we can see here where the uh, duodenum is joining the stomach here and curving back around retroperitoneally but to travel behind the stomach and attach to the posterior wall uh, and then uh, join with the uh, jejunum. So, uh, this is important to understand especially for your dissections, but also clinically as you're palpating uh, abdominal contents to know what you're feeling and where they are. So um, we're going to later on look for structures that are behind the lesser omentum. And so uh, here in this lesser curvature, we're going to find the celiac trunk, uh, which is a, a very important uh, artery. Uh, and so we'll talk about that again in a minute. Then, of course, we have the uh, duodenum with its different parts, a superior, a descending, uh, inferior, and then an ascending part you can't see here. But within all of that, we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder receives uh, its bile from the liver. The liver is forming bile and secreting it through the left and right hepatic ducts to the common hepatic duct and into the uh, the descending duodenum through the uh, duodenal papilla. The duodenal papilla has a sphincter within it, the sphincter of Odie. I don't know who, uh, who wants to name get a, get named after a sphincter. I don't understand this, but Odie apparently wanted to, or we did it to him. Uh, so anyway, the sphincter of Odie can close off this common bile duct when bile is not needed, and then it fills back up through the cystic duct and gets stored in the gallbladder. Now, there are some things that are secreted by the liver 
into this, uh, this uh, hepatic duct and into the gallbladder that are not helpful and that uh, become solidified in the gallbladder. Uh, and so these are called gallstones when this happens. That, they can be formed from an excess of cholesterol, uh, from a dietary excess, or from some sort of hormonal uh, autonomic uh, issue or some other uh, issue, not just from dietary intake. But the uh, yellow coloration of a, of a gallstone indicates the buildup of cholesterol, whereas the brownish, darker color is from bilirubin, which is the buildup of breakdown products from red blood cells. So the liver is also responsible for rejuvenating the blood and breaking down old red blood cells. And in so doing, bilirubin can be produced and um, um, form uh, solid structures in the gallbladder. And so that's what we see here is gallstones from both cholesterol and bilirubin sources. Uh, so the uh, pancreas uh, is nestled, it's the head of the pancreas, is nestled within the duodenum as the duodenum curves, but its tail travels out behind the stomach, the, um, the body of the stomach. <clears throat> and we can see here that within the pancreas is the pancreatic duct. And so that pancreatic duct uh, has a main and accessory duct. The main duct will, will uh, secrete uh, insulin into the, um, the duodenal papilla along with the bile in order to help facilitate the um, uh, production, the breakdown of enzymes. So it, it really secretes digestive enzymes into the GI tract. The insulin is more of a hormone uh, that gets secreted in the bloodstream. Uh, my apologies. So these digestive enzymes get secreted with the bile uh, to break down structures uh, that we've digested, food that we've digested, in order to release the energy inherent in them. Uh, there's also an accessory pancreatic duct um, that uh, empties proximally into uh, the duodenum. Uh, okay, okay, moving on. Into the small intestine. So uh, the, the small intestine technically has three parts. The duodenum is the first of them, then the jejunum and ileum. Uh, so some sources say that you can distinguish between the jejunum and the ileum based on some gross anatomical features. When you do your dissections, you can determine if you believe this or not. Uh, I have trouble believing it, but it's said that the jejunum has what are called mesenteric windows, uh, which means that there is a la So the visceral peritoneum, as it covers these structures, is contained in fat. In the jejunum, it's said that the fat does not approach the jejunum and leaves a small gap of transparent visceral peritoneum. And it's said that the ileum uh, does not do this. Uh, I don't fully believe this, but you can, uh, you know, do your dissections and have your opinion, and that's fine. Uh, but anyway, uh, you'll see some sources indicate that. Now, the large intestine has a number of different portions, uh, including uh, junctions. So the large intestine begins at the ileocecal junction, the cecum being the most proximal portion of the large intestine. Hanging off of the inferior portion of the cecum is the vermiform appendix. Vermiform appendix is kind of a vestigial structure that uh, houses a lot of um, pro-bacterial uh, fauna uh, within it, to, uh, which, which do a lot of things to help us digest and regulate the health of our immune system. So it's kind of a repository for that. Um, and so uh, as we travel uh, from the cecum, we get to the ascending colon, to the hepatic flexure, to the transverse colon, the uh, splenic flexure on the left, to the descending colon, sigmoid colon, finally to the rectum and the anus. Now the entire GI tract has uh, two layers of smooth muscle, and those two layers of smooth muscle are, are uh, being regulated to perform peristalsis. These are oriented in uh, an outer layer and an inner layer. Uh, 
along the entire GI tract. The outer layer is longitudinal, going the, the uh, superior inferior length of the GI tract, and the internal, uh, the inner portion is uh, circumferential. So the, this one is, is uh, squeezing the, the food up and down, and this one is pushing it uh, uh, up and down as well, so creating that action. The large intestine, that outer layer, clumps up into bands called uh, the tinea coli. The tinea coli, thus the outer layer, uh, as they do that, cause a clumping, a rounding of the large intestine. So that's why the large intestine doesn't look smooth like the small intestine. It has uh, clumps on it. And what happens, these clumps are called uh, 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 hostra. And within the hostra, it, it slows down the movement of uh, water through the large intestine so that the water can be reabsorbed uh, into the body or absorbed um, more readily. So slowing that down so we don't lose any water unnecessarily. You'll notice in your dissection hanging off of the tinea coli are small epiploic appendages, little fat appendages hanging off. They look like hanging chads if you voted in 2003, which I don't think you, none of you did. So anyway, uh, appendages, epiploic appendages, little fat things dangling off the tinea coli. Okay, moving on to the uh, branches of the artery. So the arterial branches are, are kind of interesting um, in the abdomen, and we have three unpaired branches that branch directly off the abdominal aorta, and then we have uh, four paired uh, arterial branches. So first we're talking about the unpaired. This is the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. The uh, celiac, uh, provides blood supply to the stomach and the liver. The superior mesenteric is going to supply much of the uh, jejunum and ileum, as well as some of the ascending colon uh, and the transverse colon as well. The um, inferior mesenteric is going su to supply the descending colon uh, and the sigmoid colon as well as part of the rectum. So let's take a look at these uh, celiac artery at about the location of T12 vertebrae. Uh, and this you will find by piercing through the lesser omentum in the lesser curvature of the stomach. Uh, so the superior mesenteric is going to be just a couple centimeters below that, an inch or so below that, about like a two fingers width below that behind the stomach. Uh, so you have the option of lifting the stomach up and trying to go inferior to it or leaving the stomach down and, and uh, trying to go below through that lesser curvature. Still, you'll probably have to use both techniques uh, to find it. And then about um, three or four finger widths above the bifurcation of the abdominal aorta to the uh, common iliacs, you will find the inferior mesenteric artery at about L4, just above, uh, just at about the crest of the pelvis. Uh, then we have our uh, paired branches that you can see here. Uh, inferior phrenic, we talked about in relation to the diaphragm. Uh, renal arteries branching off on either side to supply the unfiltered blood to the kidney so that it can filter it out and produce urine from uh, the uh, nitrogen uh, and other substances in the blood. The testicular the, um, and ovarian arteries, the gonadal arteries, uh, we can see here branching off. They are their own independent branches directly from the abdominal aorta. Uh, and then the um, lumbar arteries, we're going to see numerous segmental lumbar arteries, just like the intercostals, but here in the lumbar, we don't have uh, ribs, so they're just called lumbar arteries. So we'll have a, a few of those as well. So take a look at the branches of the celiac artery. Uh, celiac trunk is going to branch uh, numerous ways, but it has three main branches. It has a common hepatic a uh, left gastric 
anti-splenic artery, just named after what they're going to. This is too easy stuff. The common hepatic is the most complicated. It's going to give off the right gastric before uh, giving off a gastroduodenal. Uh, then it forms the proper hepatic artery that becomes the right and left uh, hepatic artery uh, traveling into the liver. Now, we notice that we have a left gastric and a right gastric that are on the lesser curvature of the stomach. The greater curvature of the stomach has gastroomental arteries, a left gastroomental branching from the splenic and a right gastroomental branching from gastroduodenal. Uh, the splenic artery also gives a branch to the pancreas uh, called the pancreatic branches. Now, this is a schematic. This is not a drawing of what it actually looks like in the body. These splenic arteries branch, I mean, the ga uh, pancreatic arteries branching from splenic are very short because the tail of the pancreas is behind the, uh, the stomach, uh, very proximal to the spleen. Uh, so you're going to want to dissect out the complete pathways of all of these arteries, and you're going to have to do that uh, using several different tactics. One is uh, to head from the organ uh, back medially, and one is to start medially and head laterally. So the spleen is easy to find, and you can start uh, following the splenic uh, artery back toward the celiac. But you also need to find the celiac trunk, find where it's branching from the abdominal aorta, and travel it out to the organs. Uh, okay, uh, and then of course we have uh, these branches uh, to the pancreas and the duodenum from gastroduodenal, uh, and the branches of the common hepatic. Uh, the proper hepatic as well. Uh, so take a look at all of those. Those are all key arteries uh, that you need to know. Uh, moving into the common hepatic artery here, we see uh, that it's giving off branches, uh, the left and the right hepatic, as well as a cystic artery, which supplies the gallbladder, of course. Now moving on to the superior mesenteric. We see here the superior mesenteric is supplying the uh, pancreas from inferiorly, as well as small portions of the duodenum there. Uh, but its main uh, course will be heading down toward the ileocecal junction. Um, and that uh, ultimately will be uh, named the ileocolic artery of superior mesenteric. <clears throat> but we'll have along the way branches to the um, Middle colic, middle colic, the middle of the colon, which is the transverse colon, so the middle colic artery, the right colic artery going to the right colon, which is the ascending colon, and then the iliocolic artery. Uh, branching from the iliocolic heading down, we'll also have an appendicular artery as well. So all of these colic arteries, the middle, the right, we'll see the left colic artery as well, they form a uh, continuous uh, artery anastomosis around the border of the colon. Uh, and that uh, bordering artery is called the marginal artery that you can see here. Um, now, what else do we have on here? <clears throat> uh, so, with, within branching from the uh, marginal artery, we'll see that there are um, rounded structures, uh, rounded artery passages, like uh, perhaps here, which are called uh, the arcades. And branching from the arcades directly to the colon are vasa recti, straight um, um, vessels going to the colon. So uh, you'll see those, so now you can identify and name them um, pretty well. And then the inferior mesenteric, we'll see it's heading down toward the sigmoid colon, so it has branches called the sigmoid arteries, it has a superior rectal artery, and it has a left colic artery, and these are continuous with the marginal artery of superior mesenteric. So uh, this is all anastomosing around uh, continuously. Now, the venous drainage of the abdomen is very important to understand. We have two systems of venous drainage in the abdomen. We have the 
cavel system or the vena cava uh, uh, system and it drains the uh, kidneys, the uh, gonads, uh, as well as the legs and the segmental arteries we see here, the uh, hemiazygous and the azygous. So the uh, hemiazygous and azygous are part of the cavel system, but they are kind of an alternate path that avoid the abdominal uh, inferior vena cava. Um, so the, uh, the other venous system is part of the uh, portal system, the hepatic portal venous drainage system. And so uh, the, uh, the veins named after those three unpaired arteries, the, the, um, the superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric vein, uh, the, as well as like the left, the, the stuff that you would see is analogous to the celiac trunk, those all drain into the hepatic portal vein which drains this blood into the liver. And then the liver will filter this blood and break down, uh, you know, caloric contents, vitamins, lipids, as well as uh, do some, a degree of protection from uh, pathogens and viruses that might enter the blood supply. This is important, this portal system is important because it's draining the uh, visceral abdominal organs the uh, stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, which is absorbing food. Uh, so if you think of the human body as kind of a donut and our mouth and our GI tract is the hole, the opening, uh, all of the GI tract is technically open to a degree to the external environment, which means pathogens enter our GI tract and can potentially gain entry into our body into our bloodstream through the GI tract. So this portal system means that the blood uh, from the GI tract flows first through the liver and the liver filters and breaks down all of that blood and supplies an immune uh, capacity uh, to that blood before the blood is then drained into the inferior vena cava and sent to the heart. So this is a very protective mechanism uh, for our bodies uh, to filter that blood uh, that comes basically in very close proximity to the external environment. So some issues can happen with these two uh, drainage systems which will change the balance between them. So because the liver gets uh, is, is filtering all of this stuff, it can end up um, being damaged over time, blocked up, uh, so there's reduced flow through the portal system. And this can cause a backflow of blood from the portal system uh, through anastomotic junctions into the vena cavel system so that it doesn't get uh, filtered by the liver. And so uh, this condition can happen in alcoholism, uh, psoriasis of the liver or cirrhosis of the liver, um, as well as um, uh, like pathogenic infection, uh, uh, cancers, tumors of the liver that uh, block off its ability to function, uh, numerous uh, issues like that. So here are the anastomotic points between the portal and caudal systems. And there's uh, four primary ones we can see here. So one here, the esophageal veins. So there are veins along the esophagus and they link up with uh, the portal system and the superior vena cava. Uh, so that those esophageal veins uh, running down your esophagus uh, in the thorax uh, join up with this portal system. The uh, ligamentum teres hepatis and the umbilical veins uh, can be, if, if there's pressure in the portal system, that can reopen the ligamentum teres hepatis. Uh, so that's an interesting anastomotic point we see here uh, in number two. Uh, also, um, number three, we have the colic veins, uh, which can back up into the renal veins. And finally, we have the superior rectal vein, which is part of the caval system, and the inferior rectal vein, which is part of the portal system. So because of this, because we can 
These are locations of anastomoses. If there's a pressure imbalance in this system, then we will see that in the form of distended veins at these locations. So some of these distended veins uh, we will be able to see uh, at these locations which are uh, end up called various different things. Esophageal varices along the esophagus, distended veins from the uh, internal view of the esophagus, those can be seen. Caput medusa, the head of medusa, uh, looks like distended veins all along the abdomen around the uh, umbilicus. And then hemorrhoids is the classic one that can be seen uh, in the anus and rectum. So uh, looking for hemorrhoids, uh, you know, although, uh, you know, not uh, the most common uh, or pleasant way of looking at this, it can be an important sign of cancers or any sort of liver problem. And the liver is going to be the location where cancers in any of these other visceral organs ends up traveling to. So colon cancer, rectal cancer, um, um, you know, in a, stomach cancer, any of these, uh, they're going to end up traveling through the portal system and lodging in the liver because the liver is designed to filter. So a, a cancer in the liver is uh, likely from a um, um, uh, from a metastasis from another cancer in the abdominal viscera. And so here are some examples of what those look like. You can see here the hemorrhoids, uh, the esophageal varices, and then uh, always interesting and a fun reaction is the caput medusa where we have these distended veins all along the abdomen. Uh, so uh, the paraumbilical structures. Okay, moving on uh, next to the kidney. We see the kidney here. Uh, so we're looking at the various uh, different gross anatomical structures of the kidney. Of course, we have the renal cortex, which is just inside the fibrous capsule. So the connective tissue that is coating the uh, liver, the fibrous capsule and then the uh, renal cortex. The renal cortex is gonna contain the uh, glomeruli, uh, Bowman's capsule, uh, so those capillary uh, structures. The renal medulla is what contains the, um, uh, the ducts, uh, like the, the tuberous ducts, like the loop of Henle. Uh, so those are you know, uh, microscopic structures that are helping to uh, uh, filter the and maintain a proper osmotic balance to the blood and so you're learning a, you're probably learning about those in physiology and, and their functions but now you know anatomically where they are and so those ductules in the medulla end up draining uh, the the collected um, compounds into the minor calyces of the renal pelvis so uh, the papilla here the renal papilla of the medulla is the point where those tubules uh, release the collected fluid into a minor calyx. And two minor calyces join together form a major calyx. And then uh, major calyces form the renal pelvis, which drains into the ureter, which attaches to the bladder. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, we can't talk about the kidney without talking about uh, kidney stones, which are very fun uh, solid mineralizations uh, that are collected within the renal pelvis. And so, of course, these can come, because they're sharp, crystallized structures, can cause a deal of pain as they pass through uh, into the ureter uh, over various uh, uh, bottlenecks. And so some of these bottlenecks include that passage into the renal pelvis between the branches of the renal arteries, uh, as the ureter travels over the common iliac artery before getting to the bladder, and then once again, as the ureter opens up into the bladder wall uh, to release that urine into the bladder wall. So these kidney stones can be surgically removed. Uh, let's see, uh, surgically removed, laparoscopic surgery, those sorts of things. Um, 
sometimes they can be like pulverized with ultrasound um, machines to make them pass more easily. Uh, but anyway, not a fun uh, occurrence by any means. And so uh, here are the kidneys and their location within the abdomen. They are located retroperitoneally with the adrenal glands uh, on their superior surface. The uh, kidneys are actually cushioned by a fat pad that surrounds them. So you'll have to open up this fat pad and dig out the kidneys to identify them during dissection. Um, but that fat pad is important because the kidneys need to be protected uh, because they are so highly vascularized. Um, so uh, as future uh, clinicians, you're probably going to encounter patients uh, that have uh, back pain. And back pain can be the sign of issues with the kidney, including a kidney infection, but it can also be the sign of occupational hazards uh, for instance, individuals who uh, are subjected to a lot of vibrations or a lot of up and down movement, uh, excessive walking even, the kidneys are going to be jostling inside this fat pad and, and over time tear themselves away from the posterior abdominal wall. So like truck drivers uh, who uh, drive the 18-wheeler box trucks, uh, whatever, for a, a living. Uh, that vibration of the truck constantly can cause back pain from uh, kidney detachment. Uh, farmers riding on tractors, all of that sort of stuff, uh, etc., etc. So, but the um, ribs are protecting the kidneys posteriorly, then they're cushioned by this fat pad. Uh, what else do we have? So, moving into the retroabdominal wall we'll see uh, some interesting structures. Of course, we have musculature there that we have yet to encounter and we need to identify quadratus lumborum. Uh, but we've heard about psoas major and minor and iliacus when we talked about the flexors of the thigh. Now we're gonna see those. So uh, those are innervated by L2 through L4, uh, small ventral primary rami branches um, because they're so close to the vertebral column. Um, what else? Now there is going to, we talked about uh, the lumbar plexus and the lumbosacral uh, trunk and the sacral plexus before. So now we're going to talk about it again and you're going to see it in dissection. So here we can see those. So most of these uh, nerves of the lumbar plexus uh, down to L1 are innervating the abdominal muscle, muscles like the uh, obliques and the rectus uh, abdominis. Then we have a, a the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, as we know, uh, and we can see that there. And so these uh, are, have a very distinct branching pattern on the posterior abdominal wall that uh, refl is reflected here in this drawing very well. Uh, so you will look for the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve traveling around the uh, iliac crest along, uh, along the surface of iliacus. Uh, ilioingual nerve will be right along that iliac crest before it pierces through the obliques. Uh, femoral nerve you will see between the iliacus and psoas major. Uh, and then on top of that you'll have genitofemoral nerve on top of psoas major. And uh, you may or may not have so as minor. So as minor is highly variable. Sometimes it'll only be on one side, but it is a, uh, usually a very thin tendon. So don't confuse uh, the tendon of psoas major with genitofemoral. Uh, be sure to look for the muscle belly of psoas uh, minor. And then lumbosacral trunk will be deep in the pelvis, traveling down uh, deep into the pelvis. Now we can't forget about the um, autonomics in the abdomen. And so as I mentioned before, so all of this is gonna be a refresher from the autonomic lecture you just listened to. So it's really no new information. Uh, might be uh, presented a little bit differently, but it's all still there. The different plexuses of the uh, uh, sympathetic fibers are traveling along the abdominal aorta. Remember, sympathetic fibers love uh, arteries, so they're traveling with the arteries, and you can see that here. Um, they are named based on 
the uh, branches that they are closest to. So not too hard. Don't spend uh, any time on, on this. Um, the abdominal viscera uh, is innervated through this abdominal plexus on the abdominal aorta via the splanchnic nerves. So uh, the viscera of the thorax, of the periphery, etc., that follows the pattern of um, the postganglionic cell body being in the sympathetic chain. But the abdominal viscera follows the splanchnic nerves to a collateral ganglion. And so that collateral ganglion uh, is uh, within or near these plexi that we just talked about. And then, so that's the location of the postganglionic neuron, and then that sends its fibers uh, along these artery branches, the uh, superior and inferior mesenteric ciliac, to the target structure. So just know that the abdominal viscera can, uh, it works on these collateral ganglia. It functions over a different model than the rest of the sympathetic fibers. So here is a uh, refresher uh, showing you in detail those splanchnic nerves. The greater splanchnic from T5 to T4, uh, lesser splanchnic is T10 to, to 11, least splanchnic is about T12. Uh, and so this, these splanchnic nerves are preganglionic fibers heading to the ganglias uh, located along those primary uh, arterial branches of the abdominal aorta which supply the target organ. So, for instance, the stomach is supplied by the celiac trunk. So, the celiac ganglion is going to be the fiber, uh, the, the, gang the ganglion that's, that supplies sympathetic fibers to the stomach because it's going to travel along the celiac artery. So, no big deal here. This looks like a lot of information, but it's very straightforward. Uh, no uh, issues there. Parasympathetics, we already talked about this. Vagus nerve does down to the splenic flexure. Splanchnics uh, from S2 through S4, the sacral parasympathetics, do the rest. Descending colon, uh, uh, pelvis. So not new information there. Now we're talking a little bit about the lymphatic system. Uh, the lymphatic drainage changes at the umbilicus for the superficial lymphatic drainage. So superficial drainage above the umbilicus heads to the axillary nodes in the armpits. Superficial drainage below the umbilicus goes to the inguinal nodes. Um, so uh, that's what you're, when, when you encounter uh, enlarged lymph nodes in these areas, you know it's a superficial uh, uh, infection or possibly a metastasizing tumor that's building up in a lymph node from these regions of the body, which could be, which are superficial and could be peripheral or axial. The deep lymphatic drainage uh, travels uh, in the thoracic duct. Uh, cisterna chile, you've already heard about this. This, again, looks like a lot of information. It's not. The only thing you need to know is that these nodes exist. They're basically named after where they're located. Don't memorize this information. Just kind of Look at it once, understand it, you're done with it um, for the purposes of this class. And then again, looking at this thoracic duct, you've already had this information. So the lymphatic duct for the right uh, upper portion, the chest and up, and then the thoracic duct for the rest of the body. So that's all I have. Thanks for watching.